Hey folks, Darren with Fervent Astronomy. Today, reviewing for astrophotography, the Nikon ZF. And yes, it is Z. I'm Canadian. Give me a break. So this is my toy. Um, as you can tell, with all its jewelry, uh, it's pretty decked out. Uh, I'm not gonna make pretend like, you know, it's pristine and stuff. I got all the dingle dangles. I've got the uh, optional grip here, the uh, small rig, I don't know man, the small rig grip. Uh, they have been partnering with Nikon on several aftermarket accessories, so it is like the official grip. Um, I like it, it's good in the hand, it's got an Arca Swiss plate on it, and uh, it makes what I use this camera for more enjoyable, which is it's going around in black and white mode, my manual dials, being as pretentious as humanly possible. I even got some retro Godox flashes for it so that I can just be the best hipster, the best one. That being said, um, this camera, while it is retro styled, is, you know, basically uh, brand new. It's very recent, under a year old, and it has a very venerable 24 megapixel sensor in it. Is that sensor good for astrophotography? Yes, of course. It's been around a while, it's not a unknown quantity, but with every iteration there's you know, a little bit of tweak here and there, some new algorithms for noise. Not removal, but suppression, we should say. Um, unfortunately, stuff does get baked into the raw files with most cameras these days. So if you're going to consider getting this camera, should you expect it to do double duty for astrophotography, 24 megapixels, that's good uh, sensor density for a lot of astro. Let's find out. The fun thing is this camera with uh, a handy dandy adapter can take all of Sony's E-mount lenses and that's what I'm gonna primarily use to do this review. You know, there are some decent Nikon Z mount options as well. Just, I'm sorry guys, nowhere near as many as are available for E-mount. Uh, but with a couple hundred dollars for for what amounts to like a really tiny essentially barely there adapter with full autofocus and full support for all the tracking and stuff like this is a boon for uh, Nikon Z mount owners because you can adapt so many lenses and then use so many of the lenses that are available for Z mount natively I it's Z mount is best mount in some ways, especially with this. This one is the Megadap ETZ21. Yeah, not the pro version. There is a pro version, uh, but this is the just immediately previous version. And um, I don't know if it's worth doing a video on or whatever, but essentially basically identical to the, the newer one, minus uh, some fit problems with Tamron lenses. Uh, but besides that, flawless. I've been really enjoying this. And I've been really enjoying this. But I've been rambling for a little while, so let's see how this camera does for astrophotography. Hey folks, welcome to Lightroom, where we've got a bunch of random samples taken with the Nikon ZF 24 megapixel mirrorless camera from Nikon, of course. This is a camera that has a sensor that's, I'm pretty sure, seen the light of day in maybe even like half a dozen cameras over the years. This 24 megapixel sensor, I believe, comes from Sony Semiconductor. It's been in the Z6 Mark II, it's been in the Z6, and I believe it's been in cameras uh, like the A7 III, etc. So it's been around for a long time, but it's a good sensor, gives some good quality. And we're just going to chat about it a little bit, chat about this camera, look at some samples. I may or may not provide these for your perusal. I'll probably provide a couple. Actually, we'll get that out of the way now. If you follow the link in the description back to fervinastronomy.com, you'll find a couple of things. One, you will find a link to the samples. Two, you will find some links to some articles, including one on ISO invariance, and that will help explain why I shoot things the way I shoot sometimes. Uh, in this case, why I'm shooting at ISO 800 for some shots. Should have been shooting at ISO 800 for all of them, but this camera was still very new to me and I hadn't checked it out. Anyway, the other thing you'll find is some information on the Fornax Mounts Light Track 2, and I don't know that, oh, there's some here that are just general tracked samples. 
Uh, essentially, the Light Track 2 is a accurate portable tracker for urban astronomy, is Fornax's North American distributor. So I'm very lucky to have access to uh, this particular toy, which I use in all of my reviews when I'm tracking stuff. If you want to learn more about that, fervinastronomy.com. Again, along with those links to those articles and samples. And speaking of samples, uh, of course, as always, download the full RAWs, pixel peep, process them, see if they're as flexible as you need them to be. If there's some way for your, you know, here we've got some brightness, you know, assess the dynamic range, that type of stuff. But please remember they are my copyrighted work. I did put in the effort to, to get these and take these photos. So please respect that. And please, again, use them for the personal purpose of assessing the equipment, but don't redistribute them anywhere. Please don't misrepresent them as your own. Please don't use them as a basis for your own review, etc. I feel like uh, that's pretty self-evident, but not everyone always thinks so without being told right off the jump. So that being said, let's kind of flip through here. Here I was using the Sigma 20 millimeter F2 contemporary lens, adapted, of course, to this camera because at the time of, well, time of publishing this, it's still not available. And it worked a treat, always works a treat, matches the camera. That's why I got it. But I was out here at my club's observatory doing some volunteering and I got some time-lapse shots of, uh, of the observatory as we're all walking around and doing all that stuff. And this is right out of camera. There's no processing done here. 15 second exposure at F2 at ISO 800. This is actually really useful having this ISO, this second base ISO for this sensor at ISO 800. So what am I talking about? Well, you know, it looks like I'm a little defocused here. Anyway, don't look at that. <laughs> Uh, getting back to the ISO thing, so sensors these days are, are a marvel of engineering and technology, and they uh, quite often are what's called dual gain sensors, where they, where they will have two analog amplification stages. That's ISO's job. I, ISO does not make your sensor more sensitive. What it does is it applies gain or amplification to the signal coming out of the pixels, and that tells them how bright to be. And when you get noise is when you have a, well, there's a couple of ways that it happens. One way is that you have a poor signal to noise ratio. You're always going to have noise. There's always going to be noise. But when you have a low amount of signal, such as light captured by the sensor, and you have a thus lower proportion of signal to noise, let's say if you're doing a long exposure, like 15 seconds, you will get a lot of noise and your amplification will boost that. When the sensor is read out, when the pixels are read out, more noise is brought into the system as well. So it's better to do the amplification before that readout, which is what happens with analog amplification. Digital amplification is what happens after all of the noise is in the data, basically. And then there's a digital transformation applied to the luminosity or the brightness. It's the exact same thing as if you just came up here and boosted the exposure. So for a lot of sensors and a lot of cameras these days, only a couple of the ISOs are quote unquote real, you know, they're analog ISOs and all the others are sim simulated. So ISO 2000 in this camera is going to be taking this photo, let's say it was 15 seconds at F2, boosting things up here essentially the same way we would in Lightroom and then baking that into the file where that can become a problem is if you blow out highlights because they get locked in to the file at a higher exposure value and then when you try and recover them, you can't. So if we shoot at a lower ISO, we can maybe recover them and we don't get a noise penalty. Here, ISO 800 makes for a really good camera for static shots, especially since it's a 24 megapixel camera. Relatively low resolution means it will mask star trails, even though this is kind of out of focus. The fact that it is a 20 millimeter lens and a 24 megapixel sensor means I probably could have shot twice as long and I would have got just a little bit of star trailing, nothing really that noticeable. And that makes it good for this type of work. All right, so how is this camera besides that? Well, this time lapse is only as long as it is, roughly 140 ish shots, because I couldn't figure out the intervalometer function, which is kind of dumb. This is kind of a, it's set up dumb, it's not intuitive. It's different, I think, than the Sony's and different than other implementations. I don't like the in-camera intervalometers that are built into these cameras. Nikon, Sony, whoever, Canon, I don't care. They're always clunky. I always fall back on an external intervalometer in a lot of cases because it just works like I think it should work, but that might be a me problem. So 
I need to learn them better, but uh, basically it is good that it is there. It got me 140 shots. Then I didn't notice that it stopped. So that's in there, that's good. The other thing I really like about Nikon that I don't know why more manufacturers can't put in their cameras is the ability to customize your exposure length without having to resort to an external interferometer for bulb mode. Good grief. Like, it's 2024, that should be all cameras. I should be able to just, I want a six minute exposure and get a six minute exposure, but it's not in all of them. Luckily it is in this one. So that's really useful. I do like the fact that the screen is a flippy screen. That makes it useful for, let's say if you're doing tracked shots, that makes it really useful for doing those shots. If you're up at Zenith or something, you can still orient the screen in a way that makes sense. And you can on this camera, shut the screen or, or turn it off so that it's not bleeding light all over the place and wasting the, the battery as well. So that's very useful. So all in all, a pretty useful camera that just looks real nice. I'm not ashamed to say that I got this camera for aesthetic purposes and that it is in spades. All right, so here we have the Nikon ZF 24 megapixels. Let's compare it to a 60 megapixel camera and see what we get. So here we have the ZF on the left. Here we have the A7R5 from Sony on the right. Same lens, perfectly focused, same night, a little more trees in the in the one with the ZF because it uh, got in at the wrong time. So a couple of things right off the bat, unsurprisingly, less detail in the lower megapixel camera. No one's surprised. Less detail, but still good brightness. I am noticing something else here. You can see the A7R5 has a lot more noise, which is something that you would expect with a higher megapixel camera, but the Nikon has a lot less noise. That being said, you know, this is a, these are two minute tracked exposures. You're getting decent enough exposure, especially in the stars. You should get what you're seeing here on the right with the A7R Mark V. Look at the ZF here. This one's green, green, green. Stars usually aren't green, right? And some of you know immediately what's going on here. So for those who don't, part of the reason why the noise level looks so contained in this particular shot with the ZF is because the camera is doing what's called spatial filtering, which is a noise reduction algorithm. And what it happens to do, uh, Nikon has used it in various cameras over the years, DSLRs, mirrorless cameras, it tends to muck with stars and it has been termed star eater. And both Nikon and Sony and others do spatial filtering to reduce noise in their raw, in their files. It does get baked into the raw files. And that's why we're seeing this here like this. However, Nikon has more of a history, I guess, with star color being wrong or weird, or uh, in this case, shapes are also getting distorted. You know, one's kind of long this way, one's flat, one's round. So this is the results of spatial filtering. Now, like I always say, when it comes to this sort of thing, we're making art. This is not science. This is not a scientific camera. So for my money, it's A-OK -okay because especially with a shot like this, we're meaning for people to see it like this, right? We're not meaning for people to come in here at 400% but I do want to draw your attention to the fact that these stars will get a bit distorted. And that is the reason behind that. And it's not that it's not also happening in the Sony. I think they've just learned to tone it down a little bit because the A7R Mark V is by far the best camera I've seen from Sony for this particular thing. But yeah, here things are going to get a little bit interesting for the ZF. And you know what? That's okay. It's going to happen. It is what it is. Here we can see, of course, we're stopped down to F4. So we have a a lot of tines on these stars here, a little more blurry on the ZF. That's what more than twice the resolution gets you, I guess. So, all right, so let's compare it now to the R6. Now, I do have to apologize. This isn't the most apples to apples comparison. ZF on the left, R6 on the right. Of course, the R6 is a little bit older, a little bit lower resolution, but also I goofed when I took this and I only took one shot and it's JPEG. It is a JPEG, so please be aware of that. That being said, yeah, I mean, one of these things looks better than the other, right? It's not, it's not hard to see. So that's not necessarily the power of four megapixels, but that might have a lot to do with the JPEG compression here. So we will not worry too much about things like noise, although for these two images, like the JPEG from the R6 here does have a lot of smoothing happening whether that would be in the raw i'll never know <laughs> but i don't think there's as much spatial filtering happening because you can see while the jpeg artifacts you know darken the stars 
a little bit. They're at least star shaped or roundish and they're not green. So there is that. Of course, the resolution is a little bit different, getting less resolution from this 20 megapixel sensor. And it was never really considered to be punching that far above its weight. So it's not hard to see, although you do get a little bit more of that O3 emission here with the, uh, the R6, where there's a stronger bias towards the hydrogen alpha with the ZF. That's that. Let's take a look at one more. Let's compare it to another Canon camera, the 5D Mark III. Although, please be aware, the 5D Mark III that I'm comparing to here is Astro modified. So there is going to be a different color reproduction. That said, I've tried to adjust, if you watch the histogram, tried to adjust things to be around the same exposure value overall in the frame, and hopefully we'll, we'll get a decent comparison. So here's 24 megapixels versus 22 megapixels, and right off the jump, you can see size-wise at 400%, we're about the same. We're not really gaining a ton of re resolution with the ZF, ignoring the increased reds. We are with the 5D Mark III getting a little bit more noise, but we're also getting more normal stars here. And that's because I believe these sort of last crop of DSLRs from Canon didn't really bake in the same noise reduction, that spatial filtering that happened in other cameras, such as some of the Nikons and now in mirrorless. I think everyone does it, even Canon. In this case, yeah, you know, the stars are a little bit more star looking, I guess. <laughs> You do have a little bit more noise to deal with, but you can deal with that and you can choose to deal with it how you want, not with how the manufacturer decides it should be dealt with. So keep that in mind at normal viewing distances. None of that really comes into play. Both have fairly decent noise considering this is a two minute exposure. All said and done, I think that's probably going to wrap it up. It's a, it's a really useful camera for astrophotography. Having that second base ISO at 800 really helps for more time lapse type stuff like this. You can keep your exposure times a little bit lower while still getting nice decent exposure. It's just a good scene. You do get the whatever benefits you might get from having a lower resolution sensor with bigger pixels where theoretically uh, when it comes to very dim stuff where you might miss photons otherwise might not get over the threshold to read a pixel out with a camera like this lower megapixel count you are going to have a better time with that. So there is an outside chance that you're going to get a little bit more detail in very, very faint areas of a nebula or something using a less dense sensor as compared to a higher density sensor. So take that for what it is. But overall, pretty useful camera. Having an intervalometer built in is great. I just need to learn how to use it. <laughs> and having the ability to customize your exposure length well past 30 seconds is mwah, chef's kiss. Perfect. Despite the fact that it looks like an old film SLR, which I think for me is a plus, uh, I think this is a cromulent camera. Let's wrap this up and get out of Lightroom here. Whoa. Well, it's good. Obviously, it's good. <laughs> like, I don't know what we really expect to. To a certain extent, camera reviews for astrophotography are kind of weird because they're all going to be good if they're recent cameras. I mean, the thing that is really separating your performance is obviously the optics and whether or not you're doing wide field or deep sky or anything in between that's gonna these days be the place where you're gonna you know get the biggest impact as long as you have good tracking tracking uh, with these samples were done with the fornax mounts uh light track 2 for urban astronomy is fornax mounts north american distributor uh, so you can find those mounts on our website but uh Regardless of how you're doing it, whether you're doing on a tripod, wide field, or you're doing equatorial mount based on a refractor or something like that, you can expect pretty good performance. This is a good sensor. That's kind of frivolous in a way, but you know, foregone conclusion maybe. But at least I hope that you now have the assurances you might need to make a decision one way or the other about if this is the right camera for you. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.